Greetings again, everybody. We're going to talk here about the viral hepatitis, and this is a very important topic, especially when we talk about hep B, as we're going to see examiners love to test that. They love going after hep B for whatever reason. Um, primarily, it's because they can test you about pathophysiology, and it's very relevant pathophysiology. Reading those, those antibody antigen panels um, they can kind of test your your knowledge of pathophysiology on step two and step three. And we don't get a lot of pathophysiology on those exams, uh, but it is one place where you're really going to need to apply some of that basic science you learned as a first year med student. So uh, I recommend paying close attention here because this is some pretty relevant stuff for your exam. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel by clicking the little button on the bottom right. And you'll get alerts as I put more and more videos up. I try to do at least three a week. All right, so viral hepatitis is a viral infection of the liver, specifically the liver parenchyma. There are five types, and it helps to kind of get an idea of the differences. So first of all, A and E. What I remember is there's A, B, C, D, and E. A and E are on the ends, right? And so you get it by exposure to the ends i.e. it's fecal-oral contact. Now, anytime something is fecal-oral contact, you can get it through contaminated food, okay? So hep A is probably the most common one that we associate um, as far as foodborne hepatitis, if you will. Hep E is quite a bit less common. Uh, so both A and E are acute only. And the way you can remember that is A and E are in acute, right? Acute uh, A and E. They're also at the ends. Now, B, C, and D are different. B and C can cause chronic hepatitis. They are also spread parenterally, and that goes for B, C, and D. Now, D is a little bit different in that you have to already have a hepatitis B infection in order to get hepatitis D. And usually what happens, well, always what happens, is either you get hep B and hep D at the same time, which is actually a good thing because you're more likely to clear both, or you already have hep B and you get the hep D virus. That can be really bad. So um, this is uh, A through E, and it's very important that you understand the difference. One more thing, um, this is kind of more of a step one thing, but hep B is the only one of these five that is a DNA virus. Okay, so hep A and hep B have effective vaccinations, and there are a number of groups that we vaccinate against these viruses. Uh, hep C, unfortunately, does not have a vaccination or a post-exposure prophylaxis. All of the chronic hepatitis, B, C, and D, will increase your risk of liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. All right, so our acute symptoms of hepatitis, and primarily here we're, of course, thinking about hep A, include fever, malaise, right upper quadrant pain, weight loss, jaundice, dark urine, and light-colored stools. So think GI symptoms. GI symptoms and jaundice, okay, maybe flu-like symptoms. So you got a patient with fever and jaundice, you're always going to be looking at a hepatitis panel. Now, the way that uh, this causes dark urine and pale stools is because bilirubin is getting into the bloodstream, um, and therefore it is not getting into the stool as it should. And uh, th remember that bilirubin is the precursor to the pigments of the stool, what makes the stool brown. So if you're not getting that into the stool, then your stools are gonna be pale colored. Now the differential for viral hepatitis, the big one is alcohol or drug-induced hepatitis. The way we generally think of this is that if you have an AST that's elevated out of proportion to the ALT, it's probably alcohol or drug-induced. If on the other hand, it's ALT elevated um, out of proportion to the AST, then it is probably viral in origin. Okay, so as I said, all patients with jaundice and fever should get a hepatitis panel. That means hep A, hep B, and hep C. 
and some clues here. So recent travel or other GI symptoms, particularly diarrhea, will raise suspicion for hep A. Because it's foodborne, it could happen in outbreaks. And then IV drug use, unprotected sexual contact, that raises suspicion for hep B and hep C because remember that is spread parenterally. Now reading the hepatitis panels, I should say panels, um, is generally pretty easy if we're talking about A, C, D, and E. So with pretty much all of these, the best initial test is to get a serology. That's going to show you whether or not you have antibodies. Now remember that IgM is the initial antibody, so that will indicate acute disease. IgG indicates a more distant disease. So IgM is the initial antibody, and then IgG is the more long-term, long-lasting antibody. Um, so I put um, sort of uh, what you would look for here. I'm not going to uh, belabor all this because I pretty much explained the difference between IgM and IgG. Uh, I just want to point out, though, IgG does not necessarily mean you have chronic disease. Um, it can be present in chronic disease, but what it really means is a more uh, distant infection. So if you got hepatitis 10 years ago, um, like hep C, for instance, you will have IgG, no IgM. So that's what I mean when I say chronic. Um, so it could be uh, or a distant infection. Okay. Now, hep B is much more complicated. I just want to point out again here that hep B is a DNA virus. It's the only one that's a DNA virus. It's a member of the hepadnaviridae family, which is a DNA virus. And uh, you can remember hepadnaviridae because it's got the letters DNA in it. Okay, so there are really four markers that we look at, sometimes five, but there's four markers. The first is hepatitis B surface antigen. Now, antigen means it's part of the virus. Antibody means it's something we make to fight off the virus. So anytime you have antigen, any kind of antigen, it means you've actually had hepatitis or you have hepatitis. You will never have a positive antigen with a vaccination, for instance. So hep B surface antigen is the protein on the surface of the hepatitis B, and it indicates that you have an active infection, okay? Now hep B E antigen, this is uh, an antigen that's made in response to the DNA polymerase in hep B, the hep B virus. Uh, this is indicative of how contagious you are. So the more hep B E antigen, the more contagious you are. Okay, now we get to the antibodies. This is our response to hep B. So hep B core antibody IgM is the earliest antibody that's going to be produced. Um, so this is um, going to be present if you have a recent infection because we're talking about IgM here. Now there's another antibody that we're gonna make that's gonna be more long lasting. What is it? You probably already know, IgG. So when we measure the total hep B core antibody, what we're doing is we're measuring IgM and IgG. So if they are negative for IgM, but positive total antibody, then the remainder is IgG. And so what that means is a more distant infection. And then finally, the hep B surface antibody this is the antibody that's made in response to the hep B virus and to the vaccine. So if you have a person who only got the vaccine, they've never had a, a natural infection, this is the only one they're going to be positive for. They're not going to have antigen. They're not going to have antibody against the core um, because they never were infected. All they got was the, uh, a protein that looked like the surface antigen. And so they've made uh, antibody to the surface. That's how vaccines work, at least for hep B. So when you get the hep B vaccine, you get this hep B surface antigen-like protein, and you just create an immune response to it. And so what you'll have is hep B surface antibody. That's it. That's it. Now let's say you get an actual infection. Well, you're going to have all these antigens coming in, the surface antigen, the core antigen, the E antigen, and so naturally, you're going to make antibodies to all those things. Now, in the acute disease, you're going to have both the surface antigen and the E antigen. 
you're also going to be making antibodies and primarily at first that's going to be IgM. So you have a positive uh, IgM to core the core uh, antigen, so the HEPI core antibody IgM. You would never have that with a vaccine. Remember what you'll have with the vaccine, the only one that's going to be positive? Surface antibody. Now, surface antibody takes a little while to develop. So in the acute disease, that will still be negative. So it's the core antibody that is the first antibody that's going to come about. Uh, but the surface antigen and the E antigen will be positive. What that tells you right here is that you have an active infection. Okay? Now then there's this window period. What is the window period? Well, it basically means that we have cleared the infection, but we still haven't made all our antibodies yet. So you'll have the core antibody IgM, you'll have the total uh, core antibody. Both of those are gonna be positive. That indicates you have an immune response, but you haven't yet made surface antibodies. So that is indicative of the window period. Now, once you've recovered, all you're going to have is IgG. So you're going to have a, an IgM that's negative, meaning you don't have a recent infection, you have a distant infection, and that's why you have IgG. And so that total hep B core antibody is going to be positive, but it's all IgG. And at this point now, you've recovered and now you have made surface antibody. So with a recovered infection, you're only going to have antibody you're not going to have antigen. Now, if you do not clear it, then you're going to have antigen. So you will still have hep B surface antigen, uh, hep B E antigen. Uh, you may or may not have that. Uh, but what's going to give this away is that you persistently have those antigens after six months. So it doesn't matter if it's surface antigen or E antigen. If those are positive, either one, uh, then you have a chronic disease if they're positive after six months. And that is really how we define chronic disease. This is just a, a diagram of what goes on here. So remember that it takes a little while to develop symptoms. Uh, it's going to take a while for the hepatitis B virus to replicate enough for you to develop detectable surface antigens and E antigens. Um, so it usually takes a couple weeks. After six months, though, the antigen should be gone. You should clear it. If that persists past six months, you have a chronic infection. So some pearls. Anyone with positive antigens has been infected with hep B, and they are therefore contagious. Hep B surface antigen is the first lab that's going to become abnormal in an infection. Hep B E antigen indicates infectivity. It's equivalent to the hep B uh, DNA test, which you can also do. Anyone with a positive core antibody has had a natural infection. We do not make antibodies to the core when we get the vaccine, only the surface. People with a positive hep B surface antibody, but nothing else, they got their immunity through vaccination. Because remember, if you got it through a natural infection, you will have antibodies against surface, but also against E and against core. So you would have a core, anti uh, a core antibody that's positive if you had it through natural infection. You'd also have a hep B surface antibody that's positive. But with a vaccine, it's only going to be the surface antibody, no core antibody. Um, nothing with hep, uh, with nothing with the the E antigen or antibody. If you make it, um, it's only surface antibody with with the vaccination. And then finally, as I mentioned, if Hep B surface antigen persists beyond six months, then the patient has chronic Hep B. So the treatment. Um, it's a little bit different between hep B and hep C. So hep B is typically monotherapy, tenofovir, lamivudine, adefavir, and tecavir. They're all acceptable therapies. No one is more right than the other, so you'll only be given one of those on a test question. 
We, we monitor these patients long-term with their ALTs and ASTs. We can also monitor for, uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma via sonography. We'll start six months uh, after the positive surface antigen. We only treat them if they're in chronic hep B. Interferon used to be given, but it's not commonly used anymore because the side effects are pretty nasty. Remember, interferon is what you make when you get the flu, and it causes all those yucky flu-like symptoms. Um, so, you know, you give someone interferon, they're going to feel like crap. Uh, so we try to avoid that. Hep C is a little bit different. So Hep C, we genotype the virus, and then we let that dictate our therapy. So what's going to be useful for you to know here is the drugs that are given, uh, but you can choose either or. Um, now, in real life, you're going to you're going to genotype, and that will tell you which regimen to use. But on the test, you can pick either because you're not going to get a genotype on the test. That's well beyond the uh, the scope. So sofosbuvir and velpatisvir, or glucaprevir and piperentisvir, uh, are the two combination therapies for Hep C. You will monitor these patients' response with the HCV RNA that indicates how well you're responding. Now, here's the big difference between Hep B and Hep C therapy. With Hep B therapy, we only start therapy once they're chronic Hep B. With Hep C therapy, we start immediately. Now, we're going to start them immediately and we'll continue for 12 weeks and then we'll measure their response after the therapy and then at 24 weeks. Uh, and then we can we di we discontinue the drug at 12 weeks. Now, if they go on to chronic, we will have to continue therapy indefinitely. The only definitive cure for the consequence of hepatitis, which is cirrhosis, is of course transplantation. Cirrhosis is irreversible. Some final notes for vaccination: Hep A vaccine, pretty much travelers, homeless people. Uh, men who have sex with men, but I really don't like that because what we're thinking here is oral, anal, sexual contact, and that is not limited to men who have sex with men. There are opposite sex couples who do that too. It is certainly not a sexual practice that's limited to one sexual orientation or another. So, you know, I really don't like that. Uh, hep B vaccine, basically everyone. Uh, anyone who comes in and asks for it, give them the Hep B vaccine. As far as post-exposure prophylaxis, if it's hep A, let's say it's an outbreak, a family member got it, they eat the same meal, uh, you'll vaccinate them as long as they're over a year old and then give immune globulin if they're immune compromised or if they have some kind of chronic liver disease. With hep B, we give immune globulin and the hep B vaccine, and that includes children born to mothers with chronic hep B. There are no vaccines or post-exposure prophylaxis for C, D, and E. Both chronic hep B and chronic hep C are associated with polyarteritis nodosa and glomerulonephritis. That's important to remember. And then finally, the liver panels do not tell you the severity of the damage. Only biopsy can do that. And then something called elastography, um, which can also be done. It's a little bit less invasive than the biopsy.